I got a call saying they, you know, they'd seen a, a tape I'd posted a tape. What am I in like the nineties? Um, <laughs> they saw my tape. Um, yeah, they were like, Hey, what you do is really interesting. We'd love for you to come audition. And I was like, all that hard work, this is my make or break. And I kept making it all the way until the quarterfinals. Instead of looking at how far I'd come on this show, being a violinist that had never performed in front of anyone more than like a cafeteria of people who weren't listening. Being on stages like that in front of millions of people on TV, very different. I was performing and I got X'd in the middle of my performance. Just at, like, they only do that if they like hate what you're doing. It's not like, oh, it's okay. It's like, we hated it so much that I got X'd listening to them say these things to me that were just like so hurtful and trying not to cry on national television, just being like, and in my mind, I'm like, I told every friend I've ever met to watch tonight and to vote for me. Like, oh my gosh, I was humiliated. This podcast exists because I love talking to people and I love going deep. The purpose is to plant seeds of inspiration. We enter a space of vulnerability and relatability. And what you realize is that we are so much more alike than we are different. To quote Ramdas, we're all just walking each other home. And the show is just one step. I'm Danica Patrick and I'm pretty intense. Hello, today on the show is Lindsay Sterling. She is an incredible violinist performer. She plays the violin while dancing and doing crazy things. And maybe you even saw her uh, this past holiday season hanging from her hair on uh, a virtual show, a virtual performance she put on. Uh, she's an incredible human that really, I'm just gonna say gets it. Like the, the reason why she's successful is she just knows how to work hard as well as manifest the things in her life that she wants. Uh, but it doesn't come without its cost. She's a really, really, you know, big perfectionist. So we dive into the nature of that, you know, not being able to sort of see herself or her, you know, accomplishments and honor the inner child and all of that stuff that makes life a little bit less fun. At the end of the day, if we're going to be put into tough situations, uh, the only thing worse than the tough situation is coming away with that away without some kind of a lesson, but she's definitely um, put the time to good use and um, big things are coming for her. So wait till the end of the episode and you'll hear exactly what it is that she wants from her personal and professional life that would uh, that that's at the top of the list for the most out there goals. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Uh, you have a don't you have an asteroid named after you? Yes, my fans gave it to me for Christmas one year. How sweet is that? Are you into astrology? I'm not like actually super into astrology. Um, you know, like I, I don't know much about my sign. I like take that stuff with a grain of salt. And whenever I catch pieces of it, I always like, I like to believe that, you know, it's like I, I take bits and pieces here and there. <laughs> what, um, uh, what are you? I'm a Virgo. I was just going to ask you before we started or right before you asked that, I was going to say, are you a Vir Virgo? <gasps> really? Uh, Why yeah, do you say that? Um, cause Virgos are, uh, perfectionists. Mm -hmm. They're analytical. They're, um, practical. They're overachievers essentially, mm -hmm. and very fixated with health and perfectionism. Oh, and <laughs> so, uh, I have, um, some Virgo in my chart. And so I'm speaking from experience too. And I always say that the worst thing about a Virgo is your, um, you're an overachiever. And so you do achieve great things yet. The, the, the Virgo element doesn't allow you to feel it and, uh, and believe it and acknowledge it oh, and own it. Ooh, you're speaking my language. I know <laughs> it's yeah, it's the, it, that's the hardest part. So I always wonder if it's worse to achieve great things and not feel it or just not achieve them, but feel like you, whatever you did was baller. <laughs> right. Yes. It's, I totally have actually thought of this before. Like, what's the better reality to live in? Because you do live in your own reality. And it's like, yeah, what reality would you want to paint for yourself? Like, I don't know. So it's interesting. Yeah. So the perfectionism re resonates with you. The the analytics, the practical, the credit. Like, wh what were you thinking of when I said that? Um, yes, there are definitely parts. Of my it's funny. I feel like I am um, like split in half. And um I'm a very like, like in one side, I'm super free spirited and just like fun loving. And then there's this other very strong half of me that's very like 
goal-oriented, perfectionistic, like has to achieve, always analyzing and like, you know, like you said, not always seeing the value in like what I've done. And so it's funny, I feel like I have these two like battling sides of myself and at, at different times of my life, I've been like, you know, this side's gotten stronger and then this side's stronger. So it's mm -hmm. like, hmm, you know, they be, they each mm -hmm. play a part in my life. So <laughs> Yeah, it'd be interesting to know what your chart was. I I took a couple levels of astrology, so I can <gasps> I can read a I can kind of oh. read a chart. Oh, um, very cool. But anyway, we won't worry about that. Your sun sign is obviously the most prominent. Mine, I'm an Aries, so it's mm -hmm. uh, hence my you know red and the ridiculous red I have going on all around me. But um, mm -hmm. but uh, so uh, the other thing is uh, you grew up in Arizona. I live in Scottsdale. Oh, no way. Yes. Yeah, Arizona yeah. girl through mm -hmm. and through. Uh, I was grew up in Gilbert. Yeah. Do you miss it? I do. I love it there. And my mom and one of my sisters still lives there. And so that's kind of always going to be like home base for our family. Um, Cause that's where we always go for Christmases yeah. and you know, it's, it'll always be like home. And I love that. It's just a quick car ride away. Like I can literally just on a yeah. whim be like, I'm going to see my mom, like jump in my car and be in Arizona. Yeah. Um, cause you're probably in LA, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Whenever I drive to LA or Laguna or anywhere out that direction, I always drive to, I mean, it's imaginable that I would drive probably based on my past, but, um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's such an easy drive. And I feel like I just, you know, cruise the traffic at about 95, which always is nice. Yeah. Put you know? some good tunes, listen to an audio book or something and get to like, kind of check out for a little bit, you know, rather <sighs> than yeah, dealing with the airport, which takes about the same amount of time anyway, once you've like done the whole thing. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Well, if you were going to be on a car ride on your own for six hours, what, what, what is it that you're putting on or what have you put on recently to, to pass the time when you've driven? Let's see. Last time I drove, I listened to some of Daring Greatly from Brene Brown. It's one of yeah. my favorite books of all time. I feel like it's something I need to read every few years to like just put myself in a, like every time I read it, I'm like, yes, I just feel like I understand like my relationship with the world a little better and a little less personally. And so I love that book. So I read that last time I was going and I would intersperse it with like just today's hot, uh, top hits playlist to like, you know, when I'd start to get sleepy from like, you know, self-help book world will do that to you. Totally. <laughs> so when I'd start to get sleepy. I'd be like, all right, time to put on some of the new top hits of today. And, and like, also that WAP, let's go. Yes. All the way. It's like, oh, I have to try to keep up with this stuff. Sometimes I'm like, I have no idea what the hits are. And I'm like, I should know this stuff. I'm a musician. This is my, this is my world. <laughs> well, I mean, that's actually, I just thought how fascinating it is. Like just, you know, I'm sure you've, you've been asked a ton of times what you listen to for music, but, you know, playing the violin and having that be sort of more of like a, I don't, I, it's not really classical, but it's kind of classical, right? Like how would yeah. you categorize it? It's instrumental. It's uh, classical instrumental, like new age vibe. Well, I mean, the violin is like such a classical instrument, but mm -hmm. I do not play it in a classical way right. at all. Like, <laughs> it's funny how, you know, I still like, I actually have some of my sheet music right, right here. I still practice classical music to try to like keep up on that skill level because there's nothing that will get your chops good as much as like classical music, but it's just a totally different way of playing. And I don't even call myself a classical violinist because I have so much respect for like that art is something different. And what I do is just kind of this mixture of different sounds and tunes, very new age, um, but just using the violin as my voice. Yeah. And your body. I mean, cause oh. you're, you know, with dancing and moving, I mean like that, there's absolutely a transmission of information with that too. And what I, I, I think is crazy is that how you ended up being able to come back around in your life from being told as a child that you need to pick either dance or violin. And then you're like, gotcha, <laughs> do both now. Like how did that first off, was that, a, I mean, when you're told or that you can't do both of them, and you have to pick, was that difficult or was it easy at that point? Um, How old you know, were you? I was six years old. And so, you know, and I definitely understand it wasn't my parents being like, you can't do this. It was like, we literally can't afford right. <laughs> to give you either. And like, I understood to a certain extent that like, I didn't really understand that we had money problems, but I understood it. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And so 
being a young kid, that's actually one of the reasons I practiced so hard was because I knew that if I didn't practice, my mom was not going to keep paying for lessons that mm. I did not practice for. Like they just did not have the money <laughs> to invest into some kid that was wasting their lessons. It wasn't like you will play the violin. I had to earn that. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, so when I was told I had to pick, like they took me to a dance class and they took me to a violin lesson and they were like, all right, which one do you want to do? You know, mm -hmm. the rest of your life, basically. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I was just so darn intimidated in the dance class because like there was all these other girls and they knew the little warm up exercises. And so I was like, I'll do the violin. Like it was a private lesson. I was by myself. No one was looking at me, you know. <laughs> so but my whole life, I've just always wanted to dance. I remember I even auditioned my best friend and I from high school laugh about it, that we auditioned for the high school dance team and we had no business being in that room. Like we laugh about it because we like made fools of ourselves because <laughs> we just wanted to dance, you know, and of course we didn't make it. Um, and then it wasn't until I was in college that I thought, well, why can't I like at least move and express with the violin? Like I can do that. And it just has grown from there. Wow. So it wasn't until much later that the dancing came. Yes. Like, and it's funny, people like kind of assume that I, you know, was a dancer and then combined it with the violin, but like, absolutely not. Like in college, I had never danced in my life. And I just hmm. started to like, like I said, it was just starting with like movement. And then I was like, I started to learn about like foot placement and, oh, that's called first position. Like, oh, you turn mm -hmm. out interesting. Mm. You know? And so I started to learn like the proper form and, but it was all self-taught tiny baby steps. Really? Your dance is self-taught? Yes. Wow. All of it. I mean, I, I, the first time I ever had training was on Dancing with the Stars, huh. which was like, I don't know, three years ago. <laughs> wow. Wow. So how did it feel to, uh, had, obviously you probably weren't playing the violin when you started dancing and learning how to dance, right? You probably weren't going like, oh, I'm going to move. Oh, that felt good. Like, right? It had to have been a separate sort of practice from the yes. violin at first. Yes. I would just kind of or think to it? myself, like, what could I do? And so I would like look at videos of dancers and I'd see like, well, that's a cool move that they did only with their leg. Okay. Like I could incorporate that. And I would just like mm. pick and choose little pieces here and there. And I'd choreograph, you know, mm. these really funny little Basically, they were just movements at first. I couldn't even call it dancing. Um, but yeah, I would practice it by itself, you know, and it probably looks so funny because I'm just doing all these moves with my legs, like <laughs> with nothing in my hands. And once I had that memorized, I would start to slowly like combine it with the violin playing. But always with the intention of knowing that you couldn't use your, your hands and your arms. Right. Right? Yes. And even now when I work with choreographers, like a lot of times I have to remind them like, you know, because they'll be choreographing for like a stage performance with like my four dancers or something. And they'll be putting so many hand movements in it. And I was, you know, and I'll be like, that's really cool. But can you add a, a little bit of movement so that I can at least like look apart with them? <laughs> and they'll be like, right, right, right. You know, so I've worked with choreographers like over and over again at this point that understand the way I like to move and, you know, the, the world I live in so that they can choreograph to my needs, not just to the dancers needs. Hmm. So why did you, why did you start dancing? I started dancing because I wanted to be a performer. Like I love, you know, I always liked, like loved playing the violin. I kind of lost my passion for it along the way somewhere. And um, I started to be like, I need to find my voice in the violin. Not just like, you know, I'd always just like looked at sheet music and just regurgitated exactly what I was told to play the way they told me to play it. Like every articulation is dictated through some sort of a mark on the page. And I just lost the passion through that. I think mm -hmm. it wasn't for me. And so once I discovered, like, I want to figure out how I can be the voice, not the violin, um, it made me excited about writing. And then the kind of music I was writing, I was like, if I ever want to perform something like this kind of music, I can't just stand there. I was like, it doesn't feel right to me. It doesn't look right. right. And I was like, as a, as a person who loves entertainment, I was like, I wouldn't want to sit through a show where someone would be standing there and playing this song. It wouldn't fit to me. So I was like, well, I got to make it visual. I got to add some energy somehow. And so pretty much just came from like, what would I as a consumer want to see if I heard this music? And I was like, I'd want to see the violinist dancing. What I think is cool is that 
what I'm hearing is that you were always envisioning yourself alone on the stage. People were coming to see you. You were not part of something. You were not a, a, an aspect or in like, even with anybody or anything, it was you on the stage alone. And I think yes. that's like very confident and cool. It's, you know, funny looking back at it. I don't know where I got that tenacity to be like, I know that I can sell out shows by myself as a violinist for an hour and a half set. I know I can do it. You know, like here I was a girl that had no following. Like, I'm not sure where that tenacity came from, but I was so determined. And um, my mom even says, she's like, I knew you would succeed because I just like, because you believed it so strongly. She's like, I, of course, I was worried as a mother watching you go on this journey. But she's like, but I, I knew you'd make it. Like, I feel like I willed my career into existence. I say that often. I just believed it so strongly and, you know, wouldn't stop trying new things until I figured out something that worked. Thoughts become things. I 100% believe uh, you, you dream big, have a vision, but the magic sauce that I always say is that you actually believe it. Yes. If you, you can think all kinds of stuff and it doesn't mean that, you know, you might not get somewhere with, oh, I want to play the violin someday. And then all of a sudden it kind of leads to like, you know, Juilliard or whatever it ends up being, you know, mm -hmm. but it's the belief in the vision that actually anchors it. Absolutely. Well, cause if, you know, I look back, I think to myself how hard, like anyone has to work, like how hard I had to work to get to where I'm at today. And like I said, anybody that's like chasing dreams, you have to work your tail off. And mm -hmm. if you don't believe that, especially in the beginning, those thankless things you're doing that aren't getting any traction, if you don't believe genuinely that they are steps towards something, you know, and if you're like, I actually don't believe I can do this, there's no way you're going to keep doing that thankless journey that's hard and lonely and, you know, and it feels kind of blind sometimes. And if you don't believe you can do it, there's no way you're going to keep after it. I always call that blind faith. Like there yeah, was a lot absolutely. of reasons why I didn't feel like I was, why I shouldn't have made it in racing, except all I can say is that I just had blind faith and I believed that it was going to work. Yeah. Like, no damn reason. Like I'm 19 years old coming back from England with a GED and no job for like basically two years and like no reason. And then a couple of years after that, I'm driving an Indy car and almost won the Indy 500. Like there's no good reason yes. why it worked out. There's, but there's got, there's it. I get that, but tell me about your parents. What were they like? And was one of them a really big dreamer or uh, supported you in a way that felt um, empowering? Did they lead by example? Yes, my parents both were so supportive. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that played a huge role in my belief in myself mm -hmm. is because I, you know, I knew that they were my biggest fans, you know, and they, they would show up continuously to whatever mm -hmm. it was that I was excited about and dreaming about. Um, you know, they were always there. And I remember, I think one of the most impactful things from my childhood is that my dad, um, he was a great storyteller and he was a writer. Like he actually wanted to be a, like a film writer, write screenplays. And he had like these different screenplays that he had written and he would read them to me as like well, bedtime stories or he would also tell us tales from his own life. And sometimes I couldn't tell which were the tales from his own adventures and which were the made up stories. He would almost like sometimes meld the two together. And wow. so it was just such a fun world to grow up in where these were stories he had created somehow in his life. And I remember from a really early age saying, dad, I want to live a life like you. I want to travel to places. I want to meet people. I want to do things. Um, and he said, you will. You will, you know, and just that sense that he had lived a life of adventure, not because he succeeded at all of his dreams. He actually never became that famous screenplay writer that he wanted to be. But boy, he went for it mm. and he he lived a life of adventure because he tried and he loved his life. You know, he had a family and he, you know, he ended up being a teacher and he loved being a teacher. But also the great stories came from the fact that he tried. And so it kind of mm -hmm. taught me that there's no shame in going after what you want in life. And, 
you know, because whether you end up at the goal you imagined or not, you will live a colorful life and go places and meet people and see things and have stories. Um, and I wanted more than anything. So it's almost kind of like he taught me the value of the journey. And that's what I was actually seeking for. Ah, oh, that's great. I, I was, I refer to this book all the time, but um, Mindset by Carol Dweck is about, um, you know, just a growth versus fixed mindset. Mm -hmm. And um, sort of the point is to really orient and fixate and look at the effort and the journey and um, instead of the accomplishment, yeah. uh, because then the, basically you spend most of the time in journey anyway. And so instead of like, I, I think it's fascinating that, you know, people that are put into this fixed mindset where it's all about accomplishment, they totally, they don't even do things because they're so afraid of failing because that yeah. is more traumatizing than, than, than doing it at, than doing it and being successful. Like the, the, the that exceeds the pain yes. of failing exceeds the joy of succeeding. Ooh, that that's crazy? really powerful. You know, and it, it is interesting, you know, cause even going back to what you said at the very beginning of like, you know, being a Virgo, sometimes we don't always, you know, or I don't always see the accomplishments of, you know, because mm. we're, I'm so fixed on like the goal. And it's been a journey for me to learn to see where I'm at and to enjoy where I'm at rather than just focusing on where I'm going, because that mm. way you don't even appreciate like <laughs> where you're at and what you've worked that once upon a time you were working to get here. And now mm. that you're here, am I just focusing on the next thing, you know, but mm. no stopping and being like, I love. The process because like you said most of life is made up of the process like mm. getting to the top of the hill is only like minutes only moments and it's fleeting right because once you get there you are like now what there's now almost what? like or it's like or you know with our little disease of not believing we actually did anything great we're like right. yeah but you know i mean this door kind of got opened for me and like you know i mean this kind of happened and i got lucky and you know <laughs> right right can you relate i'm like you know i can blow off some accomplishments to just like circumstance or luck um but uh yeah what was was there um what would, what do you feel like was the point in time where you had to like grit up the most and be, and, and, and remind yourself of just what you believed in because, you know, the shit hit the fan and you weren't feel you weren't feeling hopeful. Oh gosh, hopeful. definitely. I could think of like several points. Um, but the, I mean, the biggest one, the most public one was definitely, um, when I went onto America's Got Talent it was 2010. And at this point, it wasn't like my first time trying, like I had been trying to be a performer, you know, like for a year, I'd been traveling to random colleges, playing in cafeterias, like doing that thankless work that you're like, this is literally going nowhere. And, you know, I remember like sleeping in my car one time, just being like, this is so lonely. Like, I just don't know how much longer I could do this. And then I got a call saying they, you know, they'd seen a, a tape I'd posted and they wanted to a tape. What am I in like the nineties? Um, You're helping me feel relevant. It's okay. <laughs> they saw my tape. Um, but yeah, they were like, Hey, what you do is really interesting. We'd love for you to come audition. And I was like, this is it. All that hard work. This is my make or break. I got this. I like, I'm going to kill this. And I like worked so hard and practiced for months and I went through that first audition and made it, got to the second phase, made it through. And I kept making it all the way until the quarterfinals. And you would think that that would be like a, hey, I made it pretty far. But instead, I focus on, instead of looking at how far I'd come on this show, being a violinist that had never performed in front of anyone more than like a cafeteria of people who weren't listening, you know, being on stages like that in front of millions of people on TV, very different. And so rather than being like, wow, good job, Linz. Um, when I was in the quarterfinals, I got up there, I was performing and, and I got X'd in the middle of my performance, which is like humiliating. Like just at, like they only do that if they like hate what you're doing. It's not like, oh, it's OK. It's like we hated it so much that I got X'd. And I just remember standing there talking to them on live TV after my performance and just listening to them say these things to me that were just like so hurtful mm. and trying not to cry on national television, just being like, and in my mind, I'm like, 
I told every friend I've ever met to watch tonight and to vote for me. Like, oh my gosh, I was humiliated. Um, and I just, I remember getting off that stage and thinking, I will never step on a stage again. I can't face that. Like, it was horrifying. And, you know, I cried for hours, like, you know, and that feels like days. And, you know, finally, after like a few months, the pain inside of me, I wouldn't say it turned into like, I'm going to prove them wrong, maybe a little bit, but also it, there was just that inner voice that became stronger than the pain, stronger than the embarrassment became mm. the voice of saying, you're not done yet. Like, mm. and I really do feel so much that, you know, I relate it to spirituality and like my relationship with God, but I believe we all have like some kind of an inner voice. And if you listen to it, it won't lead you astray. And it, get getting stronger and stronger. And I just like, shoot, this journey, it's not done. Like I need to keep trying. And so I did, I got back up on stages. I didn't even know what the heck to do at this point. I was out of ideas, but just by stepping on little open mic night stages, again, the opportunity found me not through anything I did. Like, it's just, I kept taking the bait wherever I could find it till I finally bit on the right one. You got into flow. Yeah. Right. And I, I, there's those, so many things that are coming up, but you mentioned spirituality. And at the, at, as soon as you said inner voice, I was like, I have to ask what your relationship is with um, spirituality and higher self, inner child, whatever you want to God source, you know, any, any, anything you want to call it. Um, yeah. So maybe let's start there because what I'm hearing is that you, you know, you, 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 you listen to it, you acknowledge it. And so have what is, yeah, what is your relationship? Or would you call yourself religious? Would you call yourself spiritual? Did you have an experience or some moment in time where something shifted where you're like, whoa, what the hell is that? You know, I was raised religious and I used to always just answer this as like, I'm a religious person. Yeah. And since, you know, and I'm still a religious person, you know, I still go to church on Sundays and I consider myself religious, but it's become so much more, you know, it's become very spiritual feeling. It's like a very one-on-one -on -one relationship that I have with not only God, but through experiences of loss, it's, I now believe so strongly in angels. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I lost my, my father a few years ago to cancer. And right before that, I lost my best friend to cancer. And I just was like, you know what? I know that I've seen little signs that they are around me and they're looking out for me. And, you know, some people may say that like, you know, they're not real. Like you're just seeing what you want to believe. And if that's the case, amazing. I would choose to believe that these signs, I would choose to look for the positivity in my life that like, that's a sign that my dad is here with me right now. Like I just got chills even just thinking that like, yeah. it gives me I hope. Too. What did you yeah. do? I think it's like the energy of it. It is. It's the energy of hope. And like, I would choose any day to believe in the things that give me hope than the other. And I truly believe it's real. But anyways, I just feel like I, I believe in all of the above that you mentioned. I believe in the inner child, like trusting that truest form of yourself. Because mm -hmm. I think that's the closest you'll ever get to like your spirit, your own spirit is that like sweet inner child. So I believe in all of it. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever done any inner child work? No. Or what's any, that? Um, well, do you have, do you, have you ever been to therapy? Oh, yes. Lots of therapy. I hear you. Oh, yes. Lots of therapy. I had two therapists for the last year. <laughs> Oh, wow. Good for you. I mean, I definitely had one. She saw me a lot or <laughs> zoomed me a lot. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I mean, inner child work is just, you know, kind of tapping into mm. you. Uh, so much of our programming happens before we're like six. And so the inner child, like literally connecting, asking to speak to it. What oh. does... She what does she look at, you know, being a girl, maybe she's a yes. girl, maybe it's a boy, I don't know. But, you know, what does she look like? How tall is she? Yes. How does she act? What is her emotion? What are her emotions? Does she emote? Does she speak? Um, like tapping into, yeah. and again, I'm, this is from my own personal experience working with the inner child, but, um, and so a professional therapist might have some different techniques, but, um, but this is how I've sort of would start the conversation. Like you really yeah. start to develop a relationship with that inner child, but then of course it's access to your programming. So it's access to why you get triggered. It's access yeah. to why you project certain things. It's access to why you judge certain things. Um, yeah. it's access to, you know, basically your just general program of how you operate in the world. 
I feel like I did. I definitely did some of that when I was um, fighting anorexia, you know, something I went through in my late teens, early twenties. And that was, I think one, one of the really helpful techniques was just talking to the inner child. It's so much easier to love yourself when you think of yourself as a little girl whose body I'm hurting, you know, and looking at her and being like, she was perfect. You know, there was nothing wrong with her. And yeah, like it kind of helps you humanize yourself. It helped totally. me do that. I agree. I, I mean, the work that I've done too, I, I had to look at like myself as like my inner child as an actual child. Yeah. And yeah. Cause I never had boundaries before. And so mm-hmm. I had to look at the inner child as being separate from me because I wasn't able to do it for myself yet. Yeah. And so I looked at it like it was separate for me so that I could go look at a situation and go, Hmm, if that person treated a ch- my child like that, would I be okay with that? And it's like, hell no, you know, Yeah. So it's like, but I can handle it. I'll be here. I'll put up the fight, you know, I'll be tough. And, you know, but when it's something separate from you, it's like the, it's like the gateway to yourself. And then eventually you embody that as yourself. And, and, and so uh, you can then hold those boundaries and have sort of more autonomy in the way that you operate as opposed to, um, <clears throat> you know, allow people to step on you or, or to abandon yourself. So again, right. most of the time we abandon that inner child, right? Yes. I remember one time I saw what you just said reminded me of like a fan art. My fans will make little fan arts like I'm sure mm-hmm. yours do as well. And mm-hmm. they took a picture of me as a child. And then they took a meet and greet photo of me where I was with a child, but they replaced the child with me. And it was a picture of me like, you know, smiling with, you know, and giving a hug to this like version of my child self. And I remember I was, I was just really struck by that, that, composition of like, oh my gosh, like the way I see a little child when they come up to me at meet and greets, like I just get so excited and like, I, I just want to love on them and give them hugs. And I just see them so sweetly. And I just thought, what if I like saw myself like that? What yeah. if I was that kind to yeah. myself, you know? Yeah. That- Do you feel like there was a parallel in time between when you started dancing and sort of looking at the inner child. I'm not sure when you dealt with anorexia and when that point in time was, but there's, is there some kind of overlap to, uh, to the dancing or did the dancing come first? It was actually about the same time. It was uh, shortly after, probably while I was in the middle of like, at this point, I knew I had a problem and I was working on it, going to lots of group therapy and therapy. Mm -hmm. Like it was kind of in the mix of all of that. Um, and it was right about the time I feel like I'm starting to get on top of it. And that because finally I had energy again to like put into myself and art and thinking of other things, you know, than just the consuming, you know, disease that I had. And so I think it was right at the cusp of like, I was starting to get better. Mm-hmm. I wonder if it's somewhat of your inner child coming out. And so, you know, through the dance and the play, like the child wants yeah. to play, right? Absolutely. Um, do you feel like the, I'm curious if you feel like the music moves your body or does your body move the music? Oh, you know, for me, I think because my, I guess my first language of art is definitely music. Mm-hmm. Um, the music moves the body for me. Um, but it's always fun to see, for example, certain songs, I will choreograph my own movement if it's just me on stage, I'll, you know, I'll figure out what I'm going to do. But then when there's my dancers, my, da- my choreographer will mm-hmm. make the choreography for us. And I'll notice that she's letting her body dictate what the music says, because she'll pick different beats and different accents than I would, which is really interesting because I'm like being led by the music. And although she is too, I think for her, the forefront is her body is reacting first. And mm-hmm. so I always think that's really cool when she'll choose She'll make different choices than I naturally would have, which I think is really fun. Have you ever put music to her, put music to dance after, like see a dance or see her sort of choreography or your own and let that inspire music and just sort of like feel how that would, you know, like how does the sound go when you, when you do the dance first? That would be really interesting to write like that. I've only done it like that, like maybe once or twice. And it was actually with Derek Huff because 
he's very interesting. He'll, he likes to kind of compose, you know, or work on some of his songs, but it's based around the dance, um, mm -hmm. you know, or he's thinking about dance as he's choreographed or as he's writing something, he'll be like, I need a hit here because I want to, you know, and he'll, but I've worked with him to like work on songs before. And it's so fun to see how he thinks and, you know, watch him use movement to convey to me what to play which is like, it'd be interesting to write an original song like that. Cause I've never done that. I've only worked on Derek stuff. I'm curious. Like, I wonder if the inner child in you is like, okay, yeah. I'm here. I'm on stage. Right. I'm, dancing, I'm moving, but I want to lead the way. Yes. Interesting. Like, move first. And then, and then come on. I just feel like, because there's such inspiration, both directions, but of course, you know, the, your, you know, your, your pattern is to create the music and then, follow it with dance, but I don't know, it's an interesting timeline to when you started dancing with everything that you were going through, which, you know, uh, you know, my understanding of eating disorders, it's very much about control. Absolutely. Were you ever able, I mean, this is maybe just helpful because I, I, you know, I was thinking the other day, I don't think there's probably a single girl that hasn't gone through a phase of some level of an unhealthy relationship with food from a control standpoint or from a restriction standpoint or from a, some, some other standpoint that revolves around food. So, I mean, anything that you're comfortable to share about where that came from and what helped you the most, I think would be helpful because it's just one of those topics that if someone's brave enough to, to speak about can be really helpful. Yes. And I agree with you. I think that it's, it's like a product of the Western way of thinking and the images we're hit with every day. I think that every girl to some extent is on that, that spectrum of like somewhere having a bad relationship with, with food or hating their body, like some sense of control around that. And, um, you know, to the extent, hopefully most people can get it under control. And for me, it happened so gradually that I never saw it. And, you know, I, but once I realized the problem, I was like, there were signs of this since I was like a child. You know, I remember putting on a snowsuit when I was like, like, I wasn't even eight years old yet. We were go getting ready to go to the snow and like put on the snowsuit. And I remember thinking how fat I looked and I was tiny, like I was a tiny little kid. And I remember putting a belt on like the snowsuit. And I told my mom, it was just to like, hold it up. But it was because I wanted a waistline. And like seven years old, like what's, that's strange. And, you know, I didn't think anything of it, but like slowly through time, it became an obsession. And for me, what I always like share with anyone who's struggling with this is that um, there's this odd mindset that happens where you feel like the eating disorder is you. You And I think separating myself from it, the same way you were talking about separating yourself from your inner child, like we're made up of so many parts and conflictions and ideas and this and that, like we have so many parts of ourselves and we're so complex. It was so freeing to me to be able to take my eating disorder and realize this wasn't a part of me. It's something that had come into me. It's something that had come on to me or whatever you want to say. And by removing it, I could say, I don't want you in my life anymore. I don't like what you've done to me. And I could treat it like a dysfunctional relationship with something else rather than a broken part of my own spirit. Um, mm. And I would talk to it. Like I would have full blown, com you know, I read a book called Life Without Ed that was the most changing book for me in my recovery, you know, aside from like therapy and group therapy, like I worked really hard on my eating disorder once I realized what the problem was because I was so miserable that I was like almost relieved when I realized what the problem was even though it was like so hard to say it the first time I remember like talking to my mom on the phone and finally saying, I think I have an eating disorder because she had been telling me for a while that she thought anyways, but once I said it, it was like, Oh my gosh, I know what the problem is now. I can fix it. Like I know how to fix problems. I, you know, I've done that before. I learned how to play the violin and I've taught myself other things. Like I can learn this. And, um, but yeah, I really turned it into a part-time job. And I think the biggest thing for me was learning to separate the broken self feeling because that's an awful feeling when you feel like you're the broken thing. Well, there's but, like, shame in that. And there's shame so much cool. shame. And when you realize that like we are never broken, like that broken things happen to us, like things will injure our heart, you know, but it's not that our heart is bad. It's that it got injured. It's not that, you know, our spirit is bad. It's just that it's been hurt. And 
So anyways, that was the biggest thing for me. And I would literally talk to it. I've had conversations with it until I called it Ed eating disorder. And I would just Mm -hmm. be like, I don't deserve to feel that way. Like, I'm not going to let you tell me that I, you know, and I still, every once in a while, I start to feel it kind of come back. I'm just Mm -hmm. like, I've done without you for a really long time. I don't need you in my life. And I'm not going to let you make me feel like that about my body. Mm. And even though sometimes that's hard to say, cause I'm like, but right now I do feel like that about my body. And it's like, but I'm not going to let you tell me to, I don't want you in my life. Yeah. That's super powerful to separate it from you. I've never heard it described like that. That's, that's so smart um, because it's really, the mind is so powerful. The mind created it. The mind can get rid of it. Exactly. And you at your core are whole and yes. perfect and pure and anything else is just the reason why it doesn't feel good is because it's not you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I remember like I had a dream one night where it it was like creepiest dream I've ever had. And it was my eating disorder was this scary woman who was controlling everything I did. And I was the only person that could see her. And I was at a party with a bunch of people in the room and she just followed me. And every time I do anything, she would hand me a piece of paper and I'd have to sign a contract with her and she'd take it. Like, it's like she knew everything I was doing and controlling it. And it was the creepiest dream. And I remember waking up just being like, that's my life. I don't want that anymore. I don't want to be controlled by this thing. It's not me. Wow. Wow. Was that, I mean, did that stuff start to peek in? I mean, cause you know, I, you, you were much younger. So you talked about dancing in college, right? So mm-hmm. you would have been barely 20. Um, I mean, then you go on stage and now you're like, now you're on stage all the time. And it, does it desensitize you even more to those thought patterns or does it make it come up even more where you have to like practice the self, you know, self-love is so overused, but practice yeah. that sort of disassociation with the thoughts and realize that they're not going to to not want them to be a part of your part of your life um or you know which side of it does it fall for you um you know i honestly think it hasn't changed it i feel like success or notoriety or any of that stuff it doesn't actually change who you are it just like amplifies whatever you are mm-hmm. and so i feel like the same triggers the same insecurities that you know the same things i'm confident about since becoming like more successful in life they've been having more money or whatever you want to say they've only all gotten bigger and i just have to kind of keep working on all the same things um you know and i continuously get better at them but that's one of them is it will come back and when it comes back it um and when i say come back it's i've never i haven't relapsed you know since like my first relapse you know in recovery but the feelings will come back and I have to nip it in the bud before it, because I know what it could do to me. And so, um, and it's funny, even with my friends, like you said, everybody's got some sort of a relationship with food. And I'll I'll talk to my friends who um, they never had eating disorders, you know, or clinically described eating disorders, but yet we'll talk about the relationship with food and how it's hard sometimes to be like, is this me being healthy and aware that maybe I do need to take a little better charge of my, my body and my diet, or is this my mind being unhealthy and lying to me and being mean? And it's like this constant battle to like evaluate. And for me, it just comes from what's the source, like what's the actual source of why I feel this way. Yeah. And you know, where is it coming from? And that can help me evaluate like, what is it valid for me to like, think I need to do a little better, you know, cause there's value in that. Or is it me beating myself up because I have low self-worth because mm. I don't think I'm enough, you know? Mm. Um, anyway, so it's, it's a constant little battle, but I just, um, I've gotten really good at recognizing when it starts to come back and it's like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> no, no, no. Mm. What helps you stay in tune? Cause that to me is like attunement, you know, Absolutely. being able to track yourself and know how you're feeling, staying, staying in touch with yourself, other things that you do to stay present. I think a lot of it comes around to like the people you surround yourself with. Like I remember being kind of nervous the first time I had a bunch of female dancers on tour with me. I was like, is, you know, they were much younger than I was. He's like little tiny bit things. And I remember thinking like, is this going to like make me feel less about my body, but the kind of people they were and the way they treated their bodies with respect made it 
fine. You know, and I realized like, this isn't going to be a problem for me, you know? And so I think it's also just like learning what does actually trigger you learning the things that like, Ooh, that's always going to make me question myself when I am around that, you know, just by learning my triggers. Um, it's really helped me. And like I said, it's just practice. The more times I've started to feel that feeling, the less far I've let it get. Yeah. Yeah. And then getting rid of them. It's like, you know, I think a lot of us can kind of look and see like what triggers us, but there's almost like a unhealthy, like relationship with wanting more of it because we're familiar with that sort of loop of thinking where we were like, Oh, mm, let's just look at that. Let's just see. Let's just, let's just, and you kind of just go to the well again, even though it's like so many, so many, you know, coaches and spiritual teachers and doctors and, you know, in the more in the esoteric sort of realm of thinking and feeling and manifesting would say that, you know, it's not, it doesn't mean it's good. It's just familiar. And so it's like, we get addicted to the hormone sort of like triggering system. Learned a lot about that from uh, Nicole LaPera, who is the holistic psychologist, you know, like it's like a, it's like a loop, you know, there's an action, there's a reaction. And then we just keep kind of going around and round and round. And we want that sort of hormone yes. spike, whatever it is. It's like, it doesn't matter. It's like people know that are on drugs. It's bad for you, but you still want it again. It's the same for that sort of um, uh, fixation on something mentally that you've, you've, you've done that creates a little reaction. Um, yes, so and getting rid of them be, is super brave. It doesn't have to be a good reaction either. Like nope. I was being tortured, absolutely tortured and miserable for my eating disorder. But it's like, we want consistency so bad. We want to totally. understand. We like familiarity. Totally. And so even though it's hurting you, it's this weird comfort because um, you understand it and That's you right. have a relationship with it. And like you said, mm-hmm. even if it's giving you a bad reaction, it's making you feel something. Um, and you know, and all these little triggers, like I think things for me are like, and they're not bad things. They're things I've learned are bad for me. I don't have a scale in my house. If I had a scale in my house, I would weigh myself 10 times today, like guaranteed. So I, (laughs) if they're in my hotel room, I call the front desk and they take it out. You know, like I just don't, if if I go to the doctor, I usually turn around. I don't look at numbers. It's not healthy for me. Mm -hmm. Same with like food journals. They're so good for some people not for me. Can't, you know, like, so I, it's realizing, yes, that may work really well for her. But that hurts me. Like it, mm-hmm. it makes me focus on the wrong thing. Mm. We've talked so much about, you know, some of the tough stuff, but you know, in typical Virgo fashion, there's so much great stuff. So <laughs> much. In fact, there's more. Um, I'm curious what this um, perfectionistic nature Like we've seen some of the manifestations of like perfectionism that aren't as feel good, Mm -hmm. but what are the ones that do like, what are the times where you can be so proud of yourself for working your ass off and having a vision Mm -hmm. and like, what were there some points in time where things happen where you're like, good job. (laughs) Yes, I have. I mean, I love putting on a show, you know, the same way I was like, I have to figure out how to be entertaining somehow. That's mine still is so alive in me. And when I like, I love not only giving a show, I love the process of planning what I think is going to be a great show. And Mm. I am so meticulously like over involved in all the details. I mean, I'll be sewing accessories on costumes till the night before the show. Like literally I'll be like, Uh, I like have people to help me, but there's always ones that I'm like, I ran out of budget and I still want that. So it's like, I'm going to figure out how to make it myself. You know, like that's just very me to like, I'm like, well, if the budget runs out, I'll, I'll get it done. I'll figure it out. You know, and a lot of the videos on screen, when I ran out of budget for my video budget of the backgrounds, like I'll make the rest of them. I'll find footage. I'll edit them. You know, so I'm just very, very very hands-on and so when that show happens <laughs> when it goes off on the first night and like I get to look into the eyes of the audience members you know it there is nothing that feel like that's why I miss touring so much is like that feeling of like exchanging love like I have this exceedingly amount like of love that comes out of me when I perform probably because the like months and the hours and the sleepless nights and the sewing accessories that I spent to get that show to these people and then to feel their love back is like it's such a connecting moment for me it's the best feeling ever Mm. 
Performers have been hit for sure the hardest with everything that's gone on because of not being able to gather. And so <laughs> right. I, I, I mean, I think it's, I like give it to you. It's been the hardest. Um, so what, I mean, in typical fashion, let's go back the other direction. Like, what did you learn in the last year that you're taking forward because you had this time that you'd never had before because I mean, you, you know, you can play the violin and you can come up with dances and you can do these things, but you're like, you're at home. I'm at home. <laughs> I will say I, I did. I'm one of the things I'm the most grateful that I did in this whole pandemic was I spent a ton of time with family. Something mm-hmm. like I went to my sister's for months, stayed at my sister's farm in Missouri with her twins uh-huh. for months of the pandemic. And it was the best. It was the best decision I ever made. And, um, you know, cause at the end of the day, like I, I sometimes get so caught up in what I do and this and being perfect and task is, blah, blah. but at the end of the day, like my family is everything. And someday I want to have kids. And it was like this really good reset for me to like focus on that and just doing a lot of like self-work, like learning about myself. And then as far as, um, skills, actually, this is another reason I'm grateful for my, like, nature as a Virgo, I guess, is that uh, I had this goal. I really wanted to do a virtual show for Christmas. I wanted to do something that would, one, give my crew work, but also allow us all to be creative and share something with my fans. And so we made this virtual Christmas show and I wanted to do something spectacular in it. Like that, I was like, what's something that would make it special? You know, because it's really hard to make a virtual show special. And I decided I wanted to do a type of aerial art performing. And I um, trained for three months to hang by my hair. And that's, I don't know if you've ever heard of hair hanging, but I saw it at a Cirque du Soleil show. And wow. yeah, who leaves a Cirque show and thinks to themselves, I want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> like what? Yeah, my sister was like, you and I are so different. She's like, that looks away from Cirque du Soleil and go, I could never do that. <laughs> That's what you're supposed to do. And I don't know why, but I saw one years ago and there was a hair hanger. And I thought, I'm going to do that someday. And here I was, I had time. I was at home and I thought, I can do that. And so anyways, I spent oh, like two and a half months training and it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And I'm not quite sure why day after day I went back and would keep strapping my hair into this hook and like being lifted and flying around. I don't know. I don't know why I kept doing it. And even my family was like, why are you doing this? Like, you're so miserable. You know, so I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing because they were all begging me to stop. But when it fit, came out and it was done, like that was the moment. That was the thing that everybody talked about was like, oh yeah, the hair hanging, like what? And so, Crazy. you know, I'll never do it again. I, I made that choice. I was like, okay, did it done, worked so hard to do it. But in a way it was an amazing thing that helped me remember that I can do hard things. I can push through. And like, we're all so much stronger than we know. We can do these things that like defy our understanding. Um, and it was a good, healthy reminder for me. To, it's been a while since I did something that felt impossible. And I think I needed to be reminded of that. Wow. You did a lot more with quarantine than most. <laughs> <laughs> Some weird things, you know, but... <laughs> That's, um, that's so true. And I believe, why do you think like somebody like a mom can flip a car over if their kid's in danger? Because like, where does this come from? Does, I mean, it fascinates me things like that to entertain the idea of what is humanly possible. And I guess what's humanly possible and what's spiritually possible are probably, um, quite different. Um, the spirit comes through the human. That's why there's extraordinary things that get done. You said, that you would go hang out with your sister and spend time in Missouri and you would, um, you, you did a lot of work on yourself and learned about yourself. I've done this throughout time to, um, one point in time the most, but I, I, I can resonates with me, those words of like learning about myself. Mm. So, uh, what did you learn about yourself? Oh, I just feel like I took a deep dive back into kind of, like I said, I feel like I've just had to learn the same things over and over again. And having everything halt made me just be like a really strong reevaluation of like, I've been in this hamster wheel for a while, hamster wheel that I, I think I really like, you know, but it's just been turning. It's like album, 
two work music videos to album to, you know, just go through the same cycle over and over again. Cause that's what you do. Yeah. And when it stopped just realizing I've been on it so long that that's the only value I have, you know, and then being on a farm in Missouri where none right. of that was possible and being like, well, what is my actual value come from? It's like, oh, it comes through the eyes of my nieces when they're giggling because I made them laugh. Mm -hmm. It comes through the eyes of my sister as we stayed up late and talked. Like, that's all that actually matters. Like, it actually makes me emotional thinking about it because we all like do these things to just prove that we're lovable, like through our entire lives. Like everybody just wants to feel like they're lovable. And they want to feel like they're enough. And we do crazy things like hanging from our hair or like working our tails off, you know, or like just groveling for everyone else to, you know, on social media to say that we're enough. But yet it's literally like, just in the eyes of the people that you actually know. It's just in those moments. Like that's all that actually matters. That's where your worth lies. And how often I forget it every day, you know, every single day. But when I have those moments and I had so many of them during COVID that just grilled it back into my head that like, that's what matters. Mm. It's the danger of being in a routine. Um, <laughs> you become forgotten. It's like goes on to that auto program mm -hmm. and there's like, it becomes more of a separation from that inner child. Right. That's like, right. wait, we were supposed to play. We were supposed to build a fort in the house with all the cushions and the pillows and like watch a movie in there. And it's, uh, you know, that's like where I think children are so magic because, you know, they remind us it's like, it's like they remind us of the inner child, you know, they, they bring it back to life again. And um, it's very healthy. It's very healthy. I'm sure kids can be a real pain in the ass sometimes, but it's also so cool to watch. It's like you get to relive being a kid again. And yeah. I don't know about you, how old you, so you were six when you started playing the violin mm -hmm. and was it pretty intense? Like meaning um, you, a lot of, uh, was it, taken very seriously. Like I said, I had to practice to get my lesson, you know, I, or I knew the lessons would stop, but my parents were never like super grilling about it. Okay. It was like, if I did my, you know, my half hour, I was good, you know, when I was a little kid, but I mean, it's still, it's a grilling instrument in general. It was every day. But every day. Yeah. It just reminds me, like for me, there's so much of my childhood. I don't remember. Like I actually yeah. don't really remember much before 10. Um, and that I started racing when I was 10. And so I feel like, you know, from, but from a very young age, I was like pushed and pushed and like doing something. And so, uh, it's almost like, I feel like there was probably some childhood I missed. And so being able mm. to see that through a child's eyes, even something simple, like climbing a tree, it's like, it's yeah. like, you know, you're filling in the gaps and like the inner child is like, so happy. Yes. I love that. You know, I was on a, it's so funny. I went hiking with a friend. This was like probably two years ago. And there was this random tree. And he goes, when was the last time you climbed a tree? <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I don't remember. And he's like, we should climb that tree. And before I could even respond to be like, I don't think that's a good idea. Because like, I'm just like always afraid I'm going to hurt my arm or break a, a leg. And then I'm like, well, there goes my tour. But he was like halfway up the tree. And so I'm like, uh, okay. And I just thought to myself, once I like, got up the tree and was just sitting there as people are like hiking by, you know, wondering what the heck we're doing in the tree. But it was like, yeah, I don't climb trees enough. I don't play enough. I don't think anybody does. But when you do, it's amazing how like, yeah, I never would have climbed that tree if he hadn't already gone up it, you know, and then I was like, well, now I feel lame, you know. <laughs> I think hanging from your hair is an ex extension Ow. of the play. I mean, to do something so crazy and out there and cool and playful, like what is the next thing that your sweet little inner child or even your extremely uh, driven, uh, high accomplishing Virgo nature is calling in right now? You know, I really like that you said that because I think that kind of boils it down to something I hadn't thought of before. Like, I really think a big reason I wanted to hang by my hair was like, I want to do something spectacular. Like that's the Lindsay that was a child. Like, 
I want to put on a show for the neighborhood. Like that, that's me at my core. Is there something else that's come up in you where you're feeling called to it? Um, or are you in and, and are you, okay, are you in an allowing flow of whatever to come next? Um, or do you feel like I want to do something? You know, I, I think right now I'm in a state of like, re-manifesting things. Um, you know, and I've even just come up with a new way that I'm like, Ooh, I like this. It's a new nightly ritual that like, I feel like it's important to switch it up every now and then for your, your style of like inner work or like whatever your meditation, whatever it is. And I've just kind of made a new form of it for myself where, um, cause I think writing is a really great way for me to like, um, you know, I, it's like, I kinesthetically feel what I'm saying. And so I used to like kind of write goals every now and then, at night. And now I've started this thing where I, I don't actually write. I just take my pencil, my pen with the lid on and I close my eyes and I write the sentences of like what I've already accomplished, you know, like the goals that I have, but I write them as if they're happening right now. Or if they, if I'm like excited about the stage I'm at in them as if they've already, they're here, they came to me. Um, but as I'm fake writing it or really writing it, but not really, um, I visualize it so that I get like multiple sides of it. And then I try to feel it as I'm writing it about how excited I am that this just happened and that like people loved it. And I had so much fun doing it, you know, but I see it, I try to feel it as I'm writing it. And it's been um, kind of a fun way to manifest. And already one of the things that I've been manifesting, I got a call two days ago and they're like, hey, this uh, this writer is excited to like, to write with you. And, I, I just think there's so much power in the belief we have in Did anyone ourselves. Teach you that? Did anyone teach you that process? Because that's totally like Joe Dispenza stuff. Like, I mean, oh. like, as, like connecting with the hot, like elevated emotion um, and embodying it, feeling it, like getting into it. And so there's a lot of times we'll have a visceral reaction. There will be yes. like sometimes tears or sometimes like joy or like, like a smile. Like there'll be some genuine actual manifestation of emotion through the visualization and, and imagination of it. Um, but no yeah. one taught you that. Well, I feel like I've, I've learned, well, I've heard people talk about all these different things. And then this was my best way of, cause I actually just listened recently to like a few of Joe Dispenza's podcasts. I love him. And then, um, a few Lewis house podcasts that were yeah. super inspirational. I just love kind of like surrounding my life with bits and pieces of all these things. And then I just took a couple of them and I was like, well, I could write it if I'm have my eyes closed. I can see it. And so I just made it up based on like the different things I've heard. Wow. Okay. Well, what else, what else is it? What, what, what else is on the list and what's coming? Cause literally it's coming. It's, it's on coming. its way. It's, it is. It's, it's been marked in the quantum. And now it's just a matter of time to line up with this human experience in the third dimension, but you've literally created it in the quantum. It's yes, happened. It's happened. So it's, and I write about like, there's probably, there's a list and some of the things are like work goals. Some of them are very like personal, like personality traits that I want to be better at, you know? And it's like the way I want to show up for other people. And so anyways, one of the things is I just, um, gosh, we focus so much on ourselves, wherever we go, whatever room we walk into, like a lot of times we're worried about ourselves. <laughs> I know I am. And sure. so I was like, I don't want to do that. I like want to walk into a room and I want to think about the other people. Like I want to put my focus on them and energy into them. And so I imagine myself doing that. And I write about that in my little book. Like that's one of the things. Um, and then other goals, like I, I've, I'm almost finished with a comic book that I've been working on for like, two years, it's almost done. And I'm like, I really want to get that made into a series, like a, an animated series or a live action series. So that's, that's one of them. Wow. What is the, mo what, it, what is the one that you're almost embarrassed to say that seems so ridiculous on the personal and on the professional Ooh. side? Okay. The professional side. Um, oh, I always talk, I always write that I have like the best show on the Vegas strip. <laughs> <laughs> that's not laughable that's real but like the the best one like mine's the most acclaimed <laughs> mine's the best. like oh there's Celine Dion but then there's the Lindsay Sterling show <laughs> I mean, Celine couldn't hang by her hair and play the violin while, oh. she, while she danced oh but I can't sing but she did this on. she did this then she like sang and like hit her chest, yes, she hits her chest. oh yeah it's arm up <laughs> Yes. Um, and then let's see on the personal side. Um, 
what's the most ridiculous one? Uh, I don't know if I have any. I probably should have some more like just funny ones, you know, like just awesome random things. But um, I know I like I guess this isn't ridiculous at all, but I like envision my future family. Like I really want twins. So I envision my family <laughs> with my twins. <laughs> wow. That's great to get two and done one and done for two. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, I I'm running out of time. So by the time that the time is finally right, if it ever comes for me, I'm like, um, let's do two. I agree. I'm 39. I'm like, if it's ever going to happen, let's hope it's twins. <laughs> exactly. No, I'm in the same boat. So Oh my God. Well, I have no doubt that there's like your list will start to get checked off and it's this do you damn do stuff like that. Like what's your favorite way to manifest? Yeah. I, I mean, uh, start talking about it, writing about it, um, visualizing it. It's all the same stuff. Um, mm -hmm. just, I'd literally take interests that I want and I turn them into businesses or if there's something I'm calling in, like, I mean, even like designing my perfect person, like I yeah. literally, got that. It's funny, like of all the things I wrote down about this person, um, one of them that I wrote down was cooks, but <laughs> so I manifested this person. And so he can't cook at all, but he, um, was a co-founder co of a huge meal delivery service that cooked for, you know, <laughs> no way. I'm like, well, I didn't clarify can cook. I just said cook. So that's hilarious. Um, but it was like so crazy how much of everything that I wrote down came true. And so writing things down that you want is, I think, probably the simplest, most effective way to get. Yeah. What you want. But I do that stuff. Um, I do that stuff all the time or I went to a week long Joe Dispenza event um, uh, not long ago, a few months ago. And um, he told us to make a mind movie. So mm. since you're so sort of creative, so you just take it's pictures like you can go into your phone and use the iMovie and you just take these pictures that you want to manifest like they're inspirational photos and then you put a song to it some song that's really important something that will be triggering something that's meaningful and you put this song to those mm -hmm. photos and then every time you hear the song you end up being visualizing the things in the in the move in the oh. mind so oh that's um, very cool oh yeah i've got a yacht on there a jet i've got you know all kinds of stuff in there Ooh. i've got you know runners for a marathon when i finally do the boston you know i've Woo! got you know i've got a oh my gosh i need to uh, yeah i need to up my my list put some like fun things on there. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I've got mountains with skiing mountains for hiking. I've got all kinds of cool stuff. So, um, yeah, it's, there's so Amazing. many ways, but you're, you're already doing it. And that is why, uh, you've already done what you, you it's in you, it's natural, it's in you. And so all you're doing is honing those abilities. And I can't wait to see you, uh, with twins, and, um, you know, bringing them on stage at the end of your performance in Vegas uh, <laughs> and, and being like, it happened. Here I am. There we go. I'll, I'll invite you. I'll invite you to the show for sure on opening night. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'll bring my twins too. Awesome. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, congrats on so much. You're just a really, really cool person. I'm really um, inspired by you and you get it. Like there's, there's, there's clearly so much um, about this, uh, you know, the, the quantum field of energy that creates things, whether it be your mind and disassociating with things or manifesting through writing and visualizing, you get it, you get it. There's no mystery. There's no question that you are meant to be doing what you're doing. Mm. Well, thank you so much. You are such a good interviewer. I love this conversation. You're just so inspired and like, yeah, I am really excited. So thank you yeah. for having me. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.